And we're live. Good day, Whiskey Brothers and Sisters, and welcome to the Whiskey Book Club's fifth book review, The Language of Whiskey by David McNichol, this one right here. As always, we're honored to have you, the viewer, and our panel with us today. My name's Dolph. I'm the president of the Alberta Scotch Society, and I'm the founder of the Whiskey Book Club, and I'm your host tonight. For those of you that are a little bit new to us, I'll explain what we're about. We are a group of whiskey geeks, and we love being that. And we love to share a dram and share our passion for reading and mostly about whiskey or whiskey-related activities. Uh, the choice of our fifth book is a return to our roots. We've spent months talking about Canadian whiskey and a little bit about bourbon, but now it's time to get back to scotch. And that's good because our common thread, no matter what we do, is our love for whiskey and our desire to try something new, which we are doing now. So our guest tonight, David McNichol, the author of The Language of Whiskey. I'll let everyone do that. They're right there. The Language of Whiskey. All right. And uh, he is a master among men. He is a whiskey aficionado. He's born and raised in the Highlands, went to the University of Aberdeen. Uh, right after the university, worked at Blair Athol, owned a travel company called Scottish Roots, which specialized in whiskey and ancestral travel, which I think is fantastic. Moved to New York 10 years ago. He was a brand ambassador, still is for several brands, and he teaches all things Scottish at the Brooklyn Brainery, which is a great name as well. Uh, and I'm sure I missed a lot, David, but we're going to get to know you a little bit more. And you're with us for another three weeks after this, so another four shows and all. So great. Let's start our roundtable introductions, including the names, your platform handles, and what you have in your glass tonight. We're starting with our special guest, David. Then we're going alphabetically through all our members. We're going to go Dave, Drew, Sheila, Kent. Cheryl's not here, but we'll say hi to her, and Nicole. So you're up, David. Hey, thanks, Dolph. Good to be back again. Good to see you all again. So I'm David. I'm the author of The, the Language of Whiskey. So pleasure to speak to you all and uh, chat a little bit more about all things uh, all things whiskey and tonight I'm uh, I'm on the Ben Levitt 15 so sly excellent and up to Dave hey guys it's Yukon Dave coming from his basement uh, in my glass is the same thing that came out of the bottle nice. you guys are gonna have to tell me who did this one 122.23 one uh, 122 should be 122 is locked on I think, I think. So. Loch Lomond, fantastic yep. Lowland. I'm talking pretty, about Lowland. It's anyways. pretty We're tasty. Good. And it's a nice pour that you've got I'm there, Dave. That's a pretty healthy draft, too. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Drew. Hi, I'm uh, Drew Semper. Um, and tonight I have uh, Oban Bay Reserve and nice. a uh, Arbeg Caesar. Okay. <laughs> I'm uh, Sheila Semper uh, on all of the social media. I am Ann Coney, and I am not drinking tonight, so Drew is double fisting it for me. <laughs> He's a good man. You're a good husband. Way to take that bullet, buddy. Hi, my name is Kent. I go by Whiskey Ass on uh, most platforms, and tonight I'm also double fisting, uh, kind of slumming with a record thread. And in the other hand, we're doing a nice Buna 18 year old. And, and my wife Cheryl is out babysitting the grandkids tonight, so she may oh. join us towards the end of this, but she might be a little too late. All right. Well, hi to Cheryl if she can hear us in the background, and hi to everyone else out there tonight. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Nick. I go by Black Hat Whiskey on uh, social media platforms, and I have a gin and smoky uh, tonic going on here, uh, paying tribute to some of our discussion tonight. Okay, and a smoky tonic is that, uh, what? what's the name of the tonic? Not tree, something tree. Yeah, fever tree, smoky ginger ale, and uh, gin in there from Sharing House. We tried that last week. It was quite good. I thought it was pretty cool. And uh, here I am, and we were talking about the Whiskey Barons today, so uh, I was trying to see what I actually had. So Johnny Walker is what I have. So I've got the Johnny Walker green, and I've got Jane Walker in the other hand. And then maybe, because we we're talking about Hague Club, I've got my little Hague Club this, and the the perfume bottle Hague Club that I have in the background. So <laughs> I'm set up for, for us right now, and I'm set up for the after dram afterwards. Everything's going to go very well tonight, I think. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> one and all. So 
here we go. We're going to jump right into it because uh, we got a lot and we, we got through maybe half our questions last <laughs> week. So I'm going to go faster. But David, you were at a perfect level. You, you do whatever you do and we're happy. But we are starting with you, David. Uh, last week, uh, the program, we discussed Edinburgh and Glasgow in relation to population density and the problems that poor or tainted water supply had on the population. We talked about that. Another aspect that you alluded to before our hour was up was the divergence between Scotland uh, based on geography and whiskey based on the Highland line. So I believe that you stated that this was the moment right now where we are in time where the lowlands focus on grain whiskey, highlands on malt whiskey. And it's also the point of no return, I believe, with the distilleries in the regions. The law allowing blended whiskey to proceed in 1860. They specialized in blends, and I don't think they ever went back from that point on. Grain and blends were too lucrative. And malts stayed that way because of transportation issues and possibly culture, I think. Is that where we are in the 1860s? Am I kind of on we the are, we, We'll need to dial the clock back a little bit before that. Back. Okay. Uh, the Highland Line was, I think I'm, I mentioned last week, was really designed for tax purposes. Okay. Most of what the big lowland distillers, uh, there's about 10 really big distillers, mostly run by the Steens and the Haig family. That okay. they were making some really toxic juice. Uh, it was just fire water. They were charging the stills 12 times an hour and really making stuff that was not designed to do anything either than get you messed up or to be sent south to London to be rectified into gin. So there was big distilleries in London who were producing uh, what we today would call grain neutral spirit. And that's essentially what the Lowland distillers were doing, but they were calling it whiskey. Uh, it wasn't always made from barley. A lot of the times it was being made from sugar and molasses. There was no regulation as to what you could make your spirit with. Okay. And you could still call it whiskey. Whereas in the Highlands, the only source really, uh, from a logistic point of view of transportation and accessibility, was barley. So barley was the optimum grain that you would use. And you would malt that barley to process it to access the sugars better. But even that was expensive because there was a tax on malt. So there was a lot going on. And in 1784, William Pitt, the prime minister, tried to get a handle on the entire situation. He wanted to tax the big lowland distillers because certainly by the mid-1780s, the lowland distillers were sending the best part of a million gallons of spirit south to London. And they weren't paying the extra duty on that, which the English distillers were. And he also wanted to encourage the Highland producers, who were all very small scale, very domestic production, to go legit, for the want of a better term. In 1781, a law had been passed that you could no longer distill spirit for personal domestic consumption. The stills that you could use up to that point were 12 gallons in size. 1781, no, you had to pay tax, even if you were drinking it in your house. It was an unpoliceable tax because in the Highlands there was no way of actually getting to anybody. So Pitt was trying to square a lot of circles and trying to reconcile the irreconcilable. And he came up with what they call the Wash Act. And it had to be amended a couple of times. But he created a line that ran from roughly Glasgow to Dundee that okay. said, so right across the middle of Scotland, south of that line, you were in the lowland category and you paid 30 shillings uh, a gallon on the capacity of your still. So however big your still was, you paid 30 shillings a gallon on that. In the Highlands, you paid 20 shillings a gallon, which was a pound, one pound sterling. So the Highland line, there wasn't a great deal of diversity, but in the Highlands, or in terms of the tax, but in the Highlands, you could only get barley from the Highlands and you could only sell your spirit in the Highlands. So there's not a big market in the Highlands and the barley wasn't high quality and the cost of transportation was much higher. So it kind of leveled out that extra 10 shillings the Lowlanders were paying. But the Lowland stills were anything up to 2,000 gallons in size. So they were paying a huge amount of tax, but they were also running the stills very quickly because you were being charged on the gallon capacity, not the gallon produced. 
produce. So the trick was, if you have a two thousand gallon still, and you're you're and you've at the beginning of the year, the government has said this will be the amount of spirit that still can produce. Ergo, you pay the tax on that, and you paid it in advance. Well, the onus on the lowlanders was to run those stills as fast as they could, and double, triple the output, and therefore it equated that tax right down. The Highlanders were stymied because they couldn't have a still bigger than 30 gallons. And they could only use peat to burn the stills, to fire the stills, not coal. And so they have to run it slower. But that meant that Lowland, uh, Highland whiskey was much better quality because it was slow run. The slow stills, the slow heat, the Holland whiskies, but they didn't care. They were selling it off to London. But 1784 is when the Highland line was drawn. And by 1800, the Highlanders were paying six pounds on a gallon capacity, but the Lowlanders were now spending or paying one hundred and sixty-two pounds per gallon capacity. Wow. So that divergence had become a gulf, and it meant that the producers in the Lowlands completely relied on being able to sell their juice to England, and the English producers, up in arms about this, they they introduced or got government to introduce an extra levy of tax. And they harried the, the, the landers, the dockers, in the Port of London to turn back the ships coming from Scotland. And so it became very difficult to get the juice into London. And then the government said to the lowlanders, you need to give a 12-month notice ahead of time and pay your tax before you can sell to England. Wow. And suddenly they took 12 months' worth of, of juice out of the market that had to be paid for in advance before you could even sell it. And so from 1794, sorry, 1788 to 1794, not a drop of juice was made in the lowlands of Scotland. It killed the lowland distilleries. The Highlanders carried on. Now, that's way before 1860, but I'll come back to that because it, it does lay the, the boundary because in 1816, the Highland boundary was abolished, but the roots were in there. So can I ask a question? Yes. I was kind of interested on the tax thing there. And you said, take, for example, the guy at a 2,000 gallon still. And so the government of England decided how many times you could run that still and then apply the tax? No, they, they decided ahead of time how much, uh, how much volume that that still should be able to produce in a given year. So, okay. so what they did was a 2,000 gallon still should be able to hold X number of gallons of wash. That X number of gallons of wash had to have... It had to be loaded at a specific gravity. And then on distilling that, you should, there was something like you should get a gallon of spirit for every 10 gallons of wash. Yeah, it, yeah. it was that kind of ratio. And that's what they, they planned the tax on. So what the lowland distillers were doing, instead of running the stills twice a day, they were running it 12 times a day. And so they, they were able to increase the volume exponentially, but paid exactly the same amount of tax. But so quality, they made a lot of money. The toilet. They made a lot of money at one time. Yes. They so they yeah. made a, a scat of money. And so that, what what happened then was that they were making so much money out of this that the, those English distillers who were themselves rebounding from the gin laws that had yeah. hit them hard was that they basically stymied. Now, when they it was interesting because in 1786, um, James Steen, who was the, really the spokesman for the what we would call the dynasty, the Hague Steen dynasty. He had a meeting with, here we go, slide hand you, to the, to the Hagues. He had a meeting with the excise, Solicitor General of the excise in Scotland and said, this law, has you can't pass this law that will stop us from going into England. And the meeting didn't go the way that they wanted it to go. And so he put um, a bundle of used £5 notes equating to £500 bribe in the man's pocket. And I think he took it as an insult to his intelligence more than the fact that it was a bribe. Oh. And they took the Steens to court. And they, they actually lost the court. They, 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 he didn't get done for corruption. But they got to that level where they were panicking about this. And, and it really took a rebound. It took until about 1805, 1806, before the lowland distillers were able to compete again. But this time, the Steens and the Hagues had twigged. They created a monopoly. So what the Steens and the Hagues did was that they had about 10 distilleries of their own, they would run five of them to run for the English market. Because if you were selling whiskey, or we, they called it whiskey, but spirit, to the English market, you couldn't, that distillery couldn't serve the home market in Scotland. 
So they had half their distilleries running for the home market and half the distilleries running for the English market. So there was other big distillers who wanted to get in on the act because the English market was lucrative. And so they, what the Steens did was they flooded the domestic market with their other stuff. So the other distilleries couldn't make any money in Scotland. So they couldn't raise the revenue to pay the extra taxes to get involved in the English game. And those who could were given about £20,000, you know, encouragement not to buy the licence for England. And so the Steens and Hayes. So there was only, I think the statistic it gets me is in 1808, there is 1 1.8 million gallons of spirit coming from Scotland to England. And it's run by five distilleries, either owned by the Hagues or the Steens. There is another 1.6 million gallons being made purely for the Scottish market with 131 firms making it. Wow. So that's a monopoly. But the and English you're not the allowed English, to blend it yet either. So no, no blend. And the English market liked this because then they were only dealing with one family. And so mm -hmm. together they they could actually petition government to make sure that any legislation made it difficult for anybody else to join in. And if you really didn't join in, then the Steens had another trick up their, their sleeve. I lived in a town called Inverkeething for a while and it had a relatively small lowland distillery and they didn't play by the Steens games. And so the Steens bought the corn mill up the stream and then it diverted all the water. So the distillery couldn't get any water, but then neither could the town. That was the town's water supply. So they shut the town's water supply off to stop this distillery producing and it went bust. Jeez. It's a cab. Yeah. They're mean. They're, yep. They play mean. In yeah, I'm going to take really that Hague stuff and just put it in the sink. Well, you know what? A lot of people have said that when I when I gave them this because this isn't available in Canada. I had a friend uh, bring that over from the UK. Ah, so, David Beckham. Uh, yeah. No, well, he signed it. No, it's yeah. it's our Canadian SMWS people when she was well working on their own stills up there brought it back for me. So it's uh, I don't know. It's 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 something to have just to show people what a grain could well how bad a grain could be. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> because well, I, I love grain whiskey, I do, and Cameron Bridge is one of my favorites, but yeah. it's it's a 30 or 35 year old Cameron Bridge as yeah, opposed to a yeah. three yeah. year old yeah. egg, right? So, yeah. Yeah. all right. Uh, so we're gonna go to the 1900s now. Yeah. We're progressing, we're moving up. Sorry. And, <laughs> and you're, you're, on. David, I'm summarizing the 1900s. I'm gonna do this in four points, and you're gonna tell me if I'm close or not. So whiskey blends have a lighter taste profile right now because they're blending now uh the tastes in england are veering away from gin or they're not allowed to have gin uh i can't pronounce this properly Pelluxera? Phylorexera. Phylorexera. Phylorexia. Phylorexia. it yeah. decimates the vineyards and the cognac industry in france uh business prowess of the whiskey barons all come together and now ensure whiskeys uh whiskeys place in scotland England and French society all because of these barons right now. So they've got that whole area and it's all under their thumb. So this, I think, David, is the perfect storm for blends to take hold of the refined and the unrefined because it was cheap. So they're selling it to their own people really cheap and they're also selling it and making a nice profit in France. And well, I'm not sure what the profit was like and what type of juice was actually going to England. Was it high quality as well? It was a bit of both. Uh, okay. the, uh, one of the great things that, that whiskey was able to do was it could become an every man's drink. So you could be selling um, aged, even blended, aged blended whiskey or using aged malts in your blend, going to a high end uh, uh, customer and using exactly the same recipe and selling the unaged stuff effectively to the lower end of society. So where the gap came with the, 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 the prohibitions, if you like, on gin, was yep. able to be fitted by cheap cheap blended whiskey, whereas those who lost out on not being able to drink their fine cognacs at their soirees, they could dive deep into exactly the same recipe of malts to grain, but just at age. So it was able to, it, it, the great thing, I always like to use the phrase, that when the wheel of fortune stops spinning, whiskey was all, Scotch whiskey was always in the right place at the right time. Okay. And it certainly took advantage. And, you know, you, you get those periods where you just have uh, just the right people, just at the right moment that you need them. And the Whiskey Barons definitely epitomized that. They took advantage um, in a way of 
I guess, the law of unintended consequences that had come out of the Excise Act of 1823, which essentially allowed the freedom to distill. And what they hadn't expected was hundreds of malt distilleries suddenly appear in the landscape. The other thing that that law did was it allowed you to warehouse duty-free. And so it encouraged the, uh, the warehousing and storing of spirit, which they then suddenly realised improved the spirit. The, the Scotch industry came late to the game to realise that maturation would, would make things better. Early maturation was actually done by the buyer, usually in the liquor the, the, the grocery store or maybe even in the bar. You went in yourself with your own flagon and they poured from a spigot from their own barrel where they were sort of doing a solero fashion, filling it up. And the quality was better than what they were buying. So they, they kind of understood maturation. But this bonding allowed that to happen. Illicit distillers wouldn't do this because you were being taxed straight from the get-go. And so there was no encouragement to sit on stock. You just needed to get out the window with it. Now maturation came along. And suddenly you, you had this palette that you could choose from. And so the blend was beginning with Andrew, Andrew Usher in Edinburgh in 1850. Andrew Usher was the first blender, the father of, of blended whiskey. And from 1850, even before the laws were changed in 1860, he was making blends, but not selling it as a blend. And then he kind of was the inspiration for the likes of the Chivas brothers in Aberdeen in the 1840s. Also John Walker, uh, John Dewar, who set up in 1837 in Perth, and a number of other merchants and, and the people who would go on to become the whiskey barons. But all the while in the background, see the whiskey barons are all vying for, you know, that's the Dewars and Jimmy Buchanan and, uh, and uh, you know, ultimately Peter Mackey and, and so on. They were, you know, they're carving up their share by creating really good blends and then putting great marketing on top of that. Where in the background, the biggest producer of all was DCL, which is Distillery Lim Distillery. Distillers Company Limited. The Distillers Company Limited was Haig. So Haig had gone and created an amalgamation. John Haig, John Haig was the last of the Haigs. The Haigs and the Steens were gone by the 1870s. In 1877, he created uh, uh, this company, uh, Distillers Company Limited, DCL. And they, certainly by the end of the century, were the biggest producers of them all. You can take Dewars, Johnny Walker, and Chivas, add all their volume together, DCL was still out doing them. There was only one company that was competing with them, and that was Patterson's of Leith. But that all went pear shaped, if you're interested in that story. Okay. <laughs> well, we kind of are. But, but we, <laughs> we, we do have to get on. And, and I, I want to put a question up here for the panel yes. because uh, we're, just, uh, we're just passing the 1900s or in there. So it's World War I time. Uh, so let's say. We're all part of Scottish society at the time. All of us. We're all Scottish. World War I started, and for whatever reason, you're all still in Glasgow or Edinburgh. Uh, the British Prime Minister, who's maybe an abolitionist himself, raises taxes on our beloved whiskey 500% to limit the national consumption of whiskey because he believes it hinders his wartime aims. I have three questions for our panel. Does your Prime Minister, a British Prime Minister, have any influence on you guys, on any of us at this point in time? So, anyone drinking, no. drinking wise, we've got one no, Sheila, Drew. Uh, I, I got to ask a question is 500% increase on what was the tax? That's going to David. <laughs> well, uh, the to put it this way, in 1914, uh, a, a bottle of, of whiskey on average cost you about four shillings. By 1918, it's cost you a pound. So the, the tax was being levied uh, on what was being produced. It was um, the licensing. It was part of the licensing and the licensing restriction act. It wasn't the first time that. So when David Lloyd George, who was the the prime minister, David Lloyd George had already started. David, you're quite correct, Dolph. He was an abolitionist. David okay. George believed in temperance. He he uh, he was a full on paid up member. He drunk the Kool Aid and he was away <laughs> down that road of abolitionism. And he actually introduced uh, a tax increase, a big tax increase, in uh, 1909, which was part of the very controversial budget that the House of Lords refused to pass, and which resulted in the end of the veto being allowed in the House of Lords. 
uh, which nearly brought Britain to a standstill in this massive constitutional crisis that they didn't have help, that the king died in the middle of it all. Um, but essentially, Britain's democratic process took another leap forward because of this budget. But during the war, he said that we we are fighting, is it, we're fighting the Kaiser, uh, we're fighting the Kaiser and we're fighting the the Emperor of Austria and we're fighting drink. And the worst of them all is drink. Now, oh. when this was passed, um, uh, I think it was Peter Mackey. I've actually, I've got some quotes here. Peter Mackey uh, from, White, from Whitehorse. Peter Mackey said, what can one expect of a Welsh country solicitor being placed without any commercial training as chancellor in a large country like this? So David Lloyd George, if it's one fact to take away from you, David Lloyd George was the only British prime minister whose first language was not English. He couldn't speak English until he was about six years old. He was a Welsh speaker. Uh, the only Welsh prime minister we've had. But uh, yes, the little Welsh chancellor, they called him. But to your, I guess to your point, in terms of if I was in Edinburgh or Glasgow and I'm getting 500% stamped onto my, my taxes, not only that, but part of the deal, the bill, also restricted opening hours in bars. So he closed the bars at like one o'clock in the afternoon, then reopened them at five, and then closed them at 10. And that law in England existed till about 15 years ago. 15 years ago, you were in London, and the last orders were 10 o'clock at night. Uh, in the, one of the biggest cities in the world, you couldn't get a drink at 11 o'clock. It really? was just ridiculous, because these were World War I regulations, and they were blanketed across. So it wasn't just, I can't afford to have my drink. I can't even go and get one. But it didn't apply in Scotland, because Scotland has a different legal system. So the law had to be amended in Scotland. And so in Scotland, every town sets its own licensing law. So in Edinburgh is a great example. There's a bar in Edinburgh called the Boundary Bar. And half of that bar is in the Port of Leith, which was an independent town in the First World War. And the other half is in Edinburgh. So when you walk into that bar today, there's a brass strip that goes right down the middle of the bar. And half of it's in Leith and half of it's in Edinburgh. But Leith had a different licensing law. You could drink till two in the morning in Leith because it was a port. And in Edinburgh, you could drink till 11 o'clock at night. So in the Edinburgh side of the bar, the bell would ring for last orders, and then everybody just crossed the brass rail into the Leith side, and you could continue drinking until two in the morning. Today, that bar can close. That bar now closes at five in the morning and reopens at six. Nice. You <laughs> <laughs> clean stuff up. That's it. Yeah. But uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. You, actually, I know people who would drink there till five in the morning, get in a taxi, get the taxi driver to drive them around the Edinburgh bypass, and get back to six o'clock and start again. We've got to do that, guys. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, no, you're laughing. We got to so, do that. We gotta, but, so in Scotland, so in Scotland, it wasn't quite as as uh, as harsh as I see. I mean, I think you'd have been in bigger trouble if you were in Manchester or Sheffield than you were in Edinburgh and Glasgow. But the Scottish towns were asked if they wanted to go dry. So every big town in Scotland had a vote on whether they would become dry towns. Now you might think that no town in Scotland would ever say yes to that. But a lot of them did. And most famously, it's Kirkintilloch. It's a town of 20,000 people. It's on the outskirts of Glasgow. It was dry till 1965. So, wow. and was, sorry, go ahead, Drew. Oh, no, I was saying, so I was reading in, in the one. So the increase in tax and the three year minimum aging. Yes. From all yes. Together, yeah. Uh, yeah. Pull a boot. Yeah, he called, off he the called that uh, the, he called it the Immature Spirits Restricting Act. Um, they, they thought he, his plan was that was the death knell for the whiskey industry in a way it actually saved it because there was a lot of really bad quality whiskey on offer and because it was completely unaged what happened was it, it separated the wheat from the chaff and only the quality whiskies would survive going forward and the Irish whiskey had not bought into the grain stills, they had not really bought into the blended process and, and the Irish whiskey was on, in big decline by the First World War Obviously, there's a lot of problems in Ireland as well, politically. So the Scotch whiskey industry took big advantage of that. And un inadvertently, the again, the law of unintended consequences, David Lloyd George had actually done something that really made Scotch whiskey a premium product. Good for David. him. David, <laughs> quick question. David, yes. quick question. Um, do you think part of the Prime Minister's viewpoint, too, was colored by his appreciation of Queen Victoria and then also the 
dislike for her grandson because of his activities and how he sort of seemed to splurge his life away is when he came to uh, power, he was fighting um, with his own leadership teams, basically, in the House of Commons and making really rookie mistakes. So it seems like there was a lot of disorder happening. David Lloyd George is a very curious character. Um, he's one of what they used to call the, the, the double act because the other big, because he was a liberal uh, politician. Uh, the liberals were the inheritors of the Whig, the, the Victorian Whig politicians. Uh, the Tories were their, um, their, their, their main opponents. And David Lloyd George's sort of partner in crime uh, was Winston Churchill, who was a liberal at that time before switching to become a conservative. And there, you couldn't have got two chalk and cheese characters. One of the things that Winston Churchill did in the Second World War was not prohibit alcohol production. In fact, he, he put taxes on bread making, but he re removed the taxes on, on whiskey making because he understood by stockpiling whiskey, it would help Britain's balance of payments uh, coming after the war. But uh, Lloyd George, yes, I think there was a lot of Victorian... He, he, he wasn't a Calvinist because he wasn't, he didn't, he, he wasn't Scottish and, and the Welsh church isn't like that, but he was very puritanical. He was very Victorian. And I think he didn't really have a lot of time for the man who would become Edward VII while he was the Prince of Wales. But the Prince of Wales was very good friends with... Uh, uh, a number of the whiskey barons, he, he would hang out with them. Tommy Dewar was one of them. But Tommy Dewar and the other great Scot that, that was very influential at the time was, was Thomas Lipton, as in Lipton Tea, uh, who was known as the King's Greengrocer. And they called them the two Tams, Tommy Dewar and Tommy Lipton. And they would hang out with the king and they would basically all just get hammered. And I think that that, that just hit Lloyd George's sensibilities. I think, the, I think there was a lot of personal accident. Good. But getting back to the call, David, it's cool. yeah. <laughs> uh, the PM has a he has an influence on us, but we don't stop drinking. Uh, I don't think we know where to drink either because, well, it depends what you are. I'm probably a farm boy because my family was farming, so I'm making my own stuff and my own still, so I'm all right. I don't know what the rest of them <laughs> are doing, though. so maybe David could help us out because did they have the speakeasies, something like that? No. In the cities? No. Nothing? There was not really a prohibition as such. It was uh, pe people... Uh, y they, they, it, was, it was the middle of the war. I mean, there was so much going on anyway. It was, uh, okay. you know, m most of the people who were your, in normal times would have been your expected clientele were, you know, knee-deep in mud in the Western Front. So, it, it, it and it was... Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think it was a time, and it certainly wasn't a time to be breaking the law put it that way okay i'd still probably you were more worried about trying to find your next meal yeah uh which was usually yeah. gin which yeah. usually gin <laughs> <laughs> uh, david de Corjumeau would agree with you with the barons but where are canadian barons and yours i thought differed but i think you just countered that argument is in the political arena so and, and Davin is, is is this guy, and we've heard of him, and we've seen him before. But I got uh, that book. So the, the barons were they politically active, as ours were here in Canada for that pressure? Did they have the ear of the prime minister or anyone that had the ear of the prime minister? Um, I would say that you know we're, we're a little bit distant in time in, t in terms of what kind of influence. Yeah. I think a lot of them had soft influence. Okay. Uh, a lot of them had, you know, they were very rich men, and so rich men generally have influence regardless. And the way that the British political system is set up was uh, up until, you know, the, the, the crisis in, in 1910, was that the House of Lords had a veto in Parliament, and the whiskey barons are so called because they were elevated to the title. They were given, a, they were given a title of nobility, which meant they could automatically sit in the House of Lords. So they they were legislators, uh, but they weren't politically active in that sense. I think, I think I love the story of Jimmy Buchanan. Your Canadian-born, yep. Scottish ancestry, Canadian-born, raised in Northern Ireland. Um, character. Uh, once he became an incredibly well man, boy. he uh, he was after That's a him. title. <laughs> yes, he was. Uh, he was after his title. I can't remember what it was Lord 
Boston home or whatever it might be, and he paid fifty thousand pounds. You can buy a title. He paid fifty thousand pounds <laughs> to be a member of the House of Lords. And okay. uh, but but what the aristocrats do is that once they get their title, they usually sign any letters or whatever just by the title, not by their own actual given names. Okay. So I, th I believe it's Lord like Wollstoneholm. So he was signing Wollstoneholm rather than James Buchanan. And so his check for 50,000, he wrote the check because he was to get the title on the 1st of January. So he post dated the check to the 2nd of January and he signed it in his title name. Because if he wasn't given the title on the 1st of January, the check would bounce on the 2nd. <laughs> and so uh, he got his title. But uh, the most, in terms of the most, I mean, and also a lot of them were very involved philanthropically, which again is against soft influence. Uh, it, it was very in vogue at the end of the 19th, early 20th century to be philanthropic on the back of perhaps the most famous philanthropic Scot, which is Andrew Carnegie. Uh, Andrew Carnegie said, the man who dies rich dies in disgrace. He gave all... Andrew Carnegie is a name as a child you get to know very early on. Mum, can I have a pound? No. Who do you think I am? Andrew Carnegie. Okay. Uh, so he gives money away. <laughs> My mum, not so much. Much more traditionally Scottish. <laughs> so a lot of them were very philanthropic in giving their money away. But the Dewar brothers, the Tommy and John, uh, where both of them were members of parliament in, in the House of Commons, both of them represented uh, seats uh, and were elected to parliament. And uh, John Dewar Jr., John uh, Dewar's son, would go on to become uh, the Lord Provost of Perth, which is like the mayor of the city of Perth. Uh, Tommy Dewar was one of the top sh high sheriffs of London. So, yeah, they, they, they had actual political power. The rest of them were generally soft power. Nice. And panel, I'm going to ask you guys because uh, okay, uh, the news is escaping me. Uh, who was it, one of our barons, that, that created their own town and then bought, well, the hospitals, the schools, everything around them? It, walk, walker. Walker. Yeah. Was Aaron. that Walker? Aaron. Aaron was walker. It was Walker. Aaron walker, yeah. And there's Aaron another walker. one, too. Just same thing, same time uh, as the Walkers as well. And it's their ville as well. Potter? No. Not Potter. Potterville. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's a great I'm making Christmas right now, but there's another one. <laughs> anyways, if one of you think about that, just throw that out to me because something it's just niggling. That anyways, Dave, so, you got a question, buddy. I got a question. So you give fifty thousand pounds and you become uh, a guy you become a member of the House of Lords. Where does that get you? Um you would be surprised. Well, probably not surprised. Uh being a member of the House of Lords and it, it and donning the airman. And, and sitting in Parliament, uh, well, first of all, you're a member of the legislature, but second, which actually allows you to be a member of the government. You, the, but not, does a check, not does a check come with that? The, not every member of the British government is a member of the House of Commons. Some of them are unelected. They're part of the House of Lords. Um, but the House of Lords doesn't have a veto. It, it, it can not It can only stop, it can only delay bills. It can't, it can't actually stop them. The House of Commons can overrule them eventually. But they, believe me, people will fall over each other just to to fawn over a lord and a lady. So even today you can you can you can buy a peerage. I think it's about three hundred and fifty thousand. But generally speaking, there's like there's now a commission. You you can't just willy nilly buy a buy a peerage. But but going back to when I was saying the crisis in nineteen oh nine, when David Lloyd George was trying to get his budget through, the, the very cons the Tory heavy House of Lords, this inbuilt hereditary peerage, stymied them. And so he went, he basically said to the king, I'm going to flood the House of House of Lords. I will create 500 new liberal peers, new, new liberal lords. And the House of Lords went, ha, 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 no chance. And the king said, yes, if that's the will of the elect. Because there was two general elections over this. And the people had come back with bigger, wig, uh, bigger liberal majorities. And the king went, yeah, if that's the will of the people, I will flood the House of Lords. And the House of Lords suddenly went, okay, back to the drawing board. We'll, we'll, <laughs> negotiate, we'll negotiate this because they were going to get wiped out. Um, so what generally still happens even today is that if the Conservative Party has an inbuilt majority in the Lords, when a Labour government comes in, it creates 20 or 30 new peers to overwhelm that. Uh, you have the crossbenchers and so on. And that's why the, the, the House of Lords is, the, is singularly, in terms of the number of participants, the largest 
chamber of any government or any parliamentary system in the Western world. I think there's 900 members of the House of Lords. Uh, each one of them, they include the law lords, which are all the chief justices of England and Scotland. They include the chief bishops of the Church of England. And uh, there's now only 92 hereditary peers. So in rather than having 700 people who are there because and because Charles II had so many illegitimate children and everyone became a lord, uh, rather than that being a reason for being there, uh, you're now what they call a life peer. You can't pass the title on. But so, yeah, I mean, you get this, the stage where, you know, you know, people like Andrew Lloyd Webber are sitting in the House of Lords making decisions. But you but it's a it's a house of patronage. It's a way of of, of using that kind of power. But back in the day, people were buying them. Yeah. How about you guys on Facebook? I've been seeing this lately. I can buy a title as Lord or oh Lady. My God. Don't. <laughs> bucks or something like that. I think it'd be fantastic. Oh, I think, yeah, I think, I think one, one that's that's called, you can have Yeah. Oh. No, I've I've got one at a um, nature preserve. Yeah, it's the 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 nature preserve by Oban. Yeah. Really. Uh, yeah. yeah. What what they did is it's similar to what uh, Cards Against Humanity did down in Texas. Is you buy, you sell off one square foot yeah. of land. You become a lord, or you become whatever. But it means if somebody wants to reclaim the land and turn it into a development or something else, they have to sue everybody that owns it worldwide. So you have to go to court for every square foot. So it's going to be a nature preserve forever. Yep. Right. That's it. Well, that's me. <laughs> Preserve, they have to go and buy back, or yeah, yeah, there's it's another it's not quite there with, is it friends of Lafroig? Yes, basically, everybody donates to this nature preserve, this tiny yeah. little piece, and they say, Okay, so you get to be lord or lady of this little tiny piece of the nature preserve, and it's a fundraiser for their nature preserve. Yeah, yeah. yeah. do you get so to, to, to the to the you have your I've, I've, I've seen, I've seen the, I've seen the advertising. Have you received your airman yes. and your coronet? Yep. Have you? Um, <laughs> Not a coronet, but I've no, got my little piece of paper. Yeah, she's got her piece of paper in the DVD, the um, all the rest. I bought one for her for Christmas last year and my dad. Nice, um, nice. And yeah, it, it's. And you get to go visit and yeah. see all the little animals and stuff. So. Oh, well, I see that's the thing. Yeah. yeah. And basically, it's just to protect a chunk of forest. So. It's, that's yeah. it. It's to protect it's a chunk of uh, yeah. nature so that nobody can come through there and develop it because it just becomes prohibitively expensive to take it to court to try to reclaim all the land. Yeah. Particularly, particularly because you're doing it in Scotland where the land system in and land ownership in Scotland is uh, is a minefield anyway. Yeah. Uh, because you have a situation where you had 300 years where you have your own legal system uh, and 300 years without your own parliament to change your own laws. So you, you, you end up with a very archaic uh, legal system and a very archaic land ownership system. Uh, the up until very, if I actually know where a lot of this, their ability to do this comes from is that there, it's called a few. A few historically was your military service that you gave to your feudal superior. So if you were a knight, you gave it to the baron, the baron to the duke, and the duke to the king. Uh, and the, the monarch is considered the paramount superior, and everybody else is the tenant inferior or tenant superior. So all the all the land belongs ultimately to the crown. And then is devolved down from that. So they, they had to remove the few. They, in, once the Scottish Parliament was set up in 1999, they were able to remove the Because you were still paying. You, you could own. I mean, I own my house and my piece of land. And I had to pay, I think, a pound a year to my feudal superior, who was the Duke of Fife. I owned the land, but I didn't own the mineral rights. Uh, the, the feudal superior. Did. And his feudal superior was the Queen. So you, it, it, but it was like a pound a year, and it was not a rent or tax. It was a feudal medieval payment. So that was scrapped by the, the new Scottish Parliament. But they had to pay off all the feus, and I think some of that areas that you're talking about was part of the feud. In, in Oban, it would have been part of the Duke of Argyll's feud that was taken from the Duke of Argyll and then probably parcelled out. So it's not like it's territorial; it's a few. So the, the, it's yeah, you're you're talking. No wonder they don't want to sue anybody. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's cool. So. Yeah, Nick and it's not Dave, like I'm ever going to get my answer. Do you that. own the Lefroy one foot by one foot? No, I mean, got... you own that. I think. No, 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 no. The, that's that, well, that's a weird rental. Doesn't matter. I applied for it. They told me I have it. And when I go have to you, Lefroy, have you been and done the? Did you do I it? Put did you... I put my yeah. flag. I got my little mini. Yeah, I drank it. It's all good. 
Well, I, I, I want to I want to use this moment as a confessional because uh, back in the tour guiding days, I used to take quite a lot of people to yes, take a lot of people down to Isla, and I had this elderly American couple on on with me, and they had bought their their square piece of land, and as you as you know, you go into the the visitor center and they give you your nationality flag, so they got the stars and stripes. And you get the map thing. It tells you it's like 14 feet in this way and 80 feet this way or whatever it might be. So you get to the edge of the field, which is on the other side of the road, and you go over the little sty. Now, this older gentleman, he, he was never going to make it over the fence, uh, <laughs> not, not without, you know, you know, medical aid. And he was selling this thing was like 300 paces this way, 200 paces that way. And it had been raining. And this oh. field was just a bog. Oh. So I offered to... I offered to to put his flag out for him, and he's like, oh, "Don't be clapping yet." You're in the shoes on. So I get over the fence with the flag, and I'm looking at this 300 feet that way. To, and I'm like, "Nope." I must have walked about. I walked about 15 foot into the middle of the thing. I just plonked it down. Oh, and the guy goes, "Do you think that's the right spot?" I'm like, "Yes." They they mark it from the far end of the field. <laughs> it's a metric. Yes, it's metric. Metric. He has no idea. Not, well, a, not a Scooby Doo. Boy was away, happy as Larry. Well, David, for for that indiscretion, I think you should drink more scotch and yeah. and say a prayer to your 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 American counterpart, which yeah. gets you really screwed. That's yeah. right. He's gonna he's gonna reclaim it, and it's gonna be some guy from the hall from Holland or something. That's good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, I gotta do this. Is the language part, and this is the one I was worried about a little bit. So, David, I, I'm gonna say five things, and you're probably gonna correct me at the end of it. So let's see how this goes. I've I've kind of practiced it, try to get the pronunciation right. We'll see. So, chapter two seems to be a cornerstone for the for the book. So it's the language episode. So let's see if I get this right. Five statements. Q Celtic, Gaelic, and Manx arrive first on the scene pushing out the indigenous and Indo-European languages. So that's step one. Two, uh, the P-Celtic, Welsh, Breton, Cornish, arrive on the scene and in most areas replace Gaelic. Three, the Vikings come and with them a massive influence in the islands and the north with the Norse language. Four, the Welsh and Gaelic language withstands the onslaught. Eventually, Gaelic supplants most others in the lowlands and the central north. And that is until the influence of the English language established and it spreads because of economic reasons and infrastructure. So, uh, and I'm going to put a quote too. I'm, I'm saying that. And I'm gonna... Oh, of course you are. Of course. <laughs> Here we go. Here it is. The importance of knowing this is these languages have woven a patchwork quilt across our land, threaded and color as a homespun kilt, deeply connected with our long, bloody, and diverse history. What did I gloss over too quickly, David? About 3,000 years of history. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Remember, I only have 11 minutes left in five no, more actually, you, actually, that was very, very, that was very succinct. That, that's, that's pretty much uh, what happened. That, well, in, in terms of current thinking, I mean, the, we know that the, the P-Celtic and the Q-Celtic languages um, are slightly diverse. They take their terms Q and P for the word for sun. So in Gaelic, it's Mac, and in, and in, and in Welsh, it's Map. So the P sound gives you P Celtic, the Mac K sound gives you the Q Celtic. And that's where they, they branch off. The P Celtic languages, it's believed, probably originated in the sort of Belgium, uh, Low Countries area, and the Q Celtic languages, probably from Iberia, so northern Spain. And they, they are considered the older of the two, not necessarily from a continental point of view, but coming into the into the British Isles earlier. Okay. And then the, the, the P-Celtic languages come in. So by the time you get to the Roman arrival in 43 AD, most of the island of Great Britain is P-Celtic speaking, uh, languages that we would recognize as being early Welsh, uh, with probably the very west coast of Scotland and the islands being still Gaelic speaking. And of course, Ireland didn't get the P-Celtic influence and so they remain Gaelic speaking. And so that, yeah, that influence, the Norse come in and they make a massive influence, particularly in the Northern Isles, where they completely supplant the, the, the P-Celtic language, Pictish completely. 
And in the Western Isles and through the Hebrides, all the way down to Isla, uh, they merge, they marry in, and they, they, they spend 700 years in the Western Isles. So when we think of it, you know, we, it's hard for the human brain to sort of say something that happened a thousand years ago as opposed to 1500 years ago, but that's 500 years worth of time. And so it was a lot of integration. Today, the Gaelic word or the Gaelic term for the islands, the Western Islands, is Anshigal, which means the island of the foreigners. And those foreigners are the Norse, but they were Gaelic-speaking Norsemen. So mm -hmm. the Norse influence in the language is huge. Uh, Isla, uh, well, we don't know what Isla means. Actually, Isla is pre-Indo-European as a name. Uh, but in Gaelic, it's often romantically referred to as Banria Nijagal, which means the Queen of the Hebrides. And so that influence is very, very strong. And then English becomes very dominant in the Southwest. We have to, you're not, it's not, we're not, we're not English speaking because of England. England and English come from the same root, which is Anglo Saxon. Yeah. So the Anglo Saxon languages are being spoken in Scotland before there's even an England. And they're really cemented by the arrival of an Anglo Saxon princess uh, who becomes Queen Mar later Saint Margaret, who marries the Scottish king. And she banishes Gaelic from the court. And the feudal system is introduced into Scotland by her son, King David I, who would have been a Gaelic speaking king. But he insisted that all trade was done in this, what we would today call Old English or Middle English. Um, but it's very similar to, obviously, what was developing south of the border. It's really not until you get to the 17th century that the rollback of Gaelic begins to happen across particularly the highlands of Scotland. And that isn't an English rollback. That's coming from Lowland Scotland. So the Gaelic word for England is Sassan, which means Saxons. So these are predating nationalities. The Gaelic word for Lowland Scotland is Sassan. So the Gaelic language doesn't distinguish between Lowland Scotland and England in terms of what they call it. Although my grandmother's term would have been Galmamacha, the strangers who live on the plains. Okay. Uh, we're only five miles away from our house, but they were the strangers on the plains. And that never the twain shall meet across the Highland line. But, but the influence of English, of course, is you know, every language in the world eventually will understand the power of, of the rollback of English, I think, because it's, it's, its ability to dominate everything is, is, is quite great. All right. And if you want to know more... That's what you're reading. You can plug through the pages and you have to reread it a little bit because that, that section right there, I had to. I went back uh, because I had to make sure I got things right. So I didn't do a, a, a map like Nick did last week with it, but I, but I did kind of. I mulled it over for a couple pages. It's not something, David, that I could read at night as I'm going to sleep because yeah, that's rereading time. So I had to reread those sections. So uh, five pages, I reread three times to make sure I yeah. got that right. I think, so, I think also, I think you mentioned in a, in a note to me that, that, that one of the things was that even though English is now the, the dominant language in terms of our whiskies, uh, it's actually disproportionately very low. There's very few whiskey distilleries actually have an English origin. Uh, the vast majority are Gallic in origin. And that actually tells you, A, where whiskey evolved from, which was from an agrarian world, an agricultural world. And those agricultural worlds of farms, those names go back at least a thousand years. Yeah. And also, as you said, another note as well, with, with people like the Celtic saints and so forth. I'm going to poke you a little bit, try to get some information from <laughs> this. But another quote. When we look at the names yeah. of the distilleries and the single malts made there, few are English language uh -huh. just like you said. <laughs> Instead, they all reflect our once diverse rainbow of mother tongues. So, David, do I sense a, uh, do I get a, a sense of Scottish pride coming out of this quote? Surviving the English oppressors with this statement, are you are you thumbing your nose to them a little bit? I'm hoping. Well, uh, yes, then. Uh, <laughs> um, no, no, I, I, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's subconscious. I don't know. I, I think that uh, coming from as as an English speaking Gael, as coming from the Gael, that it's and to see you know, and I'm not blaming England here. I'm, I'm, but the the march of English across Scotland to the detriment of the Gaelic language is. Is, is lamentable. I mean, it's, it's a language that's been there for thousands of years, and well, they now reckon that as a community language, will be dead and buried within the next fifteen. So it, it's uh, you know you're you're looking at and not just not just Gaelic. I mean, Manx is a dead language. Um, my part of the Scottish Highlands, Perthshire, the last native Gaelic speaker died in 1991. So my 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 county, where my grandmother grew up, 
speaking Gaelic. Nobody speaks Gaelic from that area. There are people who come from the islands and such. But uh, so it's almost like you're looking at an endangered species and trying to do as much as you can. And it's hard not to be slightly um, not, uh, anti-English language about it. But that's not the language's fault. That That's just how society it's, has developed and so on. English's fault. I am, yes, I, oh, yes, absolutely. Okay, so so we'll, an, well, we'll, 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 we'll put it in a, a succinct Gaelic phrase, which means put out of the house the Englishman, bring in the dog. Nice. That's <laughs> And we'll leave it at that. <laughs> Politically. Somebody made a dictionary of terms for that to keep this language going. Say again? Has somebody made a dictionary of terms for this to keep the language going? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's, uh, yeah. Uh, there is, it's the that amount of money that gets thrown at the Gaelic language is, is uh, but, but, but the prejudice is, I mean, I, I, I lived in Edinburgh for a long time, and people in Edinburgh would, would absolutely balk at the idea that the Scottish government would throw money at the Gaelic language. Uh, why would you do this at some Aboriginal gibberish? Is actually a phrase I heard from people in Edinburgh because it, 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 they just don't. There's a disconnect between the, the Gaeldom and other parts of Scotland, uh, and uh, also their own. You know, to some extent, the Gaels can be their own worst enemy. I mean, I had to do Gaelic at school, and my Gaelic teacher. At school, her husband was from the Isle of Harris, and he was a native Gaelic speaker. And yet, my my his son, who was a friend of mine, had never heard his father speak in Gaelic. He was he was ashamed to speak Gaelic in public uh, mm. because they've been told for so long that it was embarrassing. So a lot of Gaels stopped speaking their own language. Uh, that changed completely from maybe the mid nineteen eighties onwards. Now there's a lot of bilingual signage. There's a Gaelic college. A lot of schools in in, in the Highlands where all the subjects are taught in the medium of Gaelic. It's the Gaelic language, not English. English is taught as a second language. But what, you're in, what you'll end up with is you have a, a, a big 50 to 60,000 strong people of bilingualists. But the chances that they'll use in Gaelic as their principal community language on a day-to-day -day basis is going. There's a Gaelic college in Canada. As well, there's one in PEI. There has been since about the 80s, I believe. Yeah, on Sky uh, and Sal Salmo Rostick. No, there's one in there's one in Canada. In PEI. Oh, there's one. Yes, yeah. I uh, have a, a friend of mine from Nova Scotia, and she's uh, I think she gets involved. With, she teaches people the board and drum, so she's uh, she's heavily involved. I think with that too. Yeah, there's been one because uh, it started up when I was a dancer back. As a yeah, child. I think music has been a massive part of the you know the Celtic connection stuff. Uh, I keep trying to keep. I mean, and I know that in Cape Breton and. You know that that kind of negative was that you know they're in the same boat. Is that of the X number of people who can still speak it, you're still talking fifty percent or over the age of sixty, and you know it's uh it's it's problematic. But I tell you, if you are if you are you know in your twenties and you are a native Gaelic speaker, you will not be for wanting of work. Yeah, you know, the you know it, you can work in broadcasting easily because there's a lot of money in in that. Well, they should take and you. It, that it, might that's what I say. Yeah. 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 get out, Mahajo. Yeah. Is here because a lot of people here and, and Dolph because you've done it and, and it's just a case of here in North America people don't know the difference is that um, David's been saying Gaelic the whole time yes and because it's pronounced Gaelic in Scotland it's Gaelic in Ireland yeah because they're two different dialects or they're they could be almost two different languages as well um, there's I guess a dispute of whether or not they're dialects or languages I, I would say I think I think the problem is when you start drawing nationalistic boundaries across it. Also, in Ireland, Gaelic has been a vehicle historically for its national identity, but Gaelic is never a, a, a vehicle for Scottish national identity because it was seen as something that the, 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 the guys in the mountains did, not people in Edinburgh and Glasgow. But, uh, yes, yeah, someone speaking Gaelic can usually have a conversation with someone speaking Gaelic. Uh, but my great-grandfather was, great was from Skye, but my great-grandmother was from, from Highland Perthshire, and their Gaelics, even within Scotland, were different enough Sometimes they had to, to, to use English words to, to converse between the two of them. Uh, and neither of them, of course, could speak Welsh because nobody can. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, this, this is quite cool. It really is. And we get Pencil into a lot of humor. <laughs> but you are going to teach us more about it. We are. But uh, David, you might know this, but I sometimes have very long buildups to questions. <laughs> and this is going to be one such question, so so please stick with me. I will. So, I'll I'll uh, I'll back up. <laughs> get get comfortable. Pour yourself a drink. We're good. So chapter three. For these are my mountains, and these are my glens. We see just how diverse the topography and meteorology of Scotland truly is. 
So areas with too much precipitation or non-arable land making whiskey making almost impossible. All these difficulties do subside at one point, one place, Speyside. So this is a great quote explaining Space Guys distillery number supremacy. So let's get the quote on. There you that go. Quote. So as the great white peaks give way to lower ground, the fast flowing rivers reach into the barley rich lands of lower Strathspey. Here the two worlds meet, high volume, constant running cold water flowing fast off the hills and rolling arable high yielding barley country. It's beautiful. It's very, it's poetic. You're a poet, David. Who now, wrote that stuff? That's really quite good. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, question for everybody. Many of us have had this discussion before, but I'm throwing it out there again. Uh, considering the climate and geography differences in Scotland and in our own country here and the States as well, will the panel admit that there is a terroir influence in whiskey? And we talk about Waterford right there. I'm in that now. And in the States, Westland Distillery is talking about it. I want to know your opinions on terroir in whiskey. Depends. <laughs> yeah. It really depends. Give me um, more. It, well, in some of the areas where they're doing, um, like in Canada, out in New Brunswick, when we were talking to uh, the Bois. distillery about Fille de Roi, um, where they were talking about yeah. their specific areas where they're doing their small batches, yeah. Um, I think it matters. I think in places like Kilhoman, where they're doing their own um, small batch runs, where they're taking in their own barley from their own fields, then I okay. think it matters. But I think in areas where they're taking barley from, say, uh, Port Ellen, yeah. and they're taking barley from Port Ellen, and they're taking it over into their own areas, and they're taking water from somewhere else, and pumping water from, take example, um, Akintoshan. I love Akintoshan, but they're taking water from some other area and they're <laughs> porting it in. I don't think terroir matters in those cases. If you're taking your barley from somewhere else and you're shipping it in and you're taking your water from somewhere else and shipping it in, how can you possibly make an argument for terroir in that case? Okay. And Brooke does Laddie? That, yeah. Oh, go does ahead, that, Dave. Does that speak to volume producers then? If you're producing volume, you don't really care about that? Akintoshan's really not a volume producer. Akintoshan's a tiny producer. So, but it's just... It, if you're bringing stuff in from lots of places, you can't really, and they're not always bringing stuff in from lots of places. They are sometimes doing small batches, but I think it just depends on your individual batch at the time. Cause even places like a isn't always doing small batching or building from individual fields in all of their cases. It just depends on what they're doing in which batch. Kent and Nick question. Any? Well, well Go ahead, Nick. I, I agree with what Sheila's saying. You've got to look at where the grain's being grown. If it's not being grown on the farm right beside the distillery, you can't claim terroir. If you're getting it from mainland Europe, if you're importing it from Ukraine and it's going to a malt house and being malted and then bringing, being brought to the distillery, how do you claim terroir? How do you say you're looking at how the grain's growing, the type of grain, the farming practices in place, land management, all of those pieces that go into terroir? So and let me it, ask it's distilled out anyways, everybody. Let me ask a question then. So do the guys drinking the forty dollar bottle of single malt versus the hundred to two hundred dollar bottle of single malt give a crap? Oh like terror doesn't true. matter to the guys buying the low end product. hundred percent agree. But it matters it matters, it matters to me. Yeah. If you're charging me, you know three four hundred dollars because that's your claim it better be you gotta have a better story buying a thirty dollar bottle of bells do i honestly care no 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 well um, <laughs> uh, terroir is an interesting one because i've had this discussion with, with master blenders and uh people who are actually you know designing whiskeys and you know you, you it I guess it depends on your narrative. If that's going to help you sell it, then you'll use it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you, you only have to go down to Kentucky, and the idea of the water coming through the limestone is is a big selling point because in the blue glass in the blue grass country, you know, you're, you're taking all the minerals, you know, the iron stuff out of it. Uh, for Scotch whiskey, I think you guys have alluded to it. If the, you know the majority of the grain isn't actually grown on the doorstep of the distillery, uh, the Scotland or even in a very, very good summer, cannot 
produce enough barley to hit the whiskey industry. Now, the majority of grain whiskey, which of course is the bulk of blended whiskey, is made from wheat. Yeah. Uh, virtually all Scottish, which is about a million tonnes of wheat that's grown in Scotland, does go into that industry. But mostly for Scotland, they have to rely on barley from East Anglia, South East, South East of England, and from the continent, and then all the way across Eastern Europe as well. Uh, they will choose homegrown if they can, but but that's just not the nature of it. The other side of that coin is 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 is, is the process of it as well is that distillation. I mean, terroir is massive if you're making a beer, but if you double distilling it up to seventy percent alcohol, yes, a certain amount will come through. But as I said, speaking to master blenders, um, I, I mean, I'm sure you'd be happy for me to tell you, Ian McCallum at Ochentoshin, who is the youngest whiskey manager ever in Scottish, in, in modern Scottish whiskey making, Ian would tell you that uh, terroir or the distillate, or even, even as I say, the distillate, only will really influence beyond, up to about six years in the barrel. After that, the wood becomes far more important. Once you go beyond six years, it's the wood that becomes the predominant um, flavor profile in, in the product. And even if you take something like in that stable, like Beaumore, for example, so Beaumore is part of the Morrison Beaumore stable with Auchentoshin, is, is that 50% of the barrels that Beaumore use to go into their whiskey are not warehoused on Isla. They're warehoused in Springburn, Glasgow. So even the climate is in affecting most of the Beaumore you're drinking in terms of an Isla content. Now, if you are making a very small batch and you are cherry picking your barrels very carefully, maybe using third fill uh, bourbon barrels where the influence is going to be limited, then maybe you could, you could argue some terroir. But I don't think beyond it being you know marketing for uh, an audience that's that's eager for that in this day and age that that you know that that's not where you know johnny walker and bells are making their money but <laughs> but 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 i would say that no terroir is not a consciously important part of the, of the industry so uh, david i thought I've got your whiskey that's kind of out the window then say again Soon as you with going down that thought, if you were to flavor your whiskey, put it in a sherry barrel, that kind of goes out the window. Pretty much, because, yeah. yeah. I mean, also, I mean, I, there's not really. I mean, I, the influence of adding the E150 as well. I, I mean, there's so much that goes into the. Into the Don't process. go down that rabbit hole. I, I won't. I'll try not. I, won't, I feel a rabbit hole opening up there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, one. I mean, the, the, yeah, I mean, the influence of the barrel. Wood management is is key. Again, I'll, I'll quote Ian McCallum. You say that. You can make a uh, mediocre spirit and put it in a good cask and you'll make good whiskey. You make the best spirit in the world and put it in a bad cask and make bad whiskey. Yeah. Nick, you were going to say yeah. something? You are going to ask a question? I was going to, like, you were talking about terroir and is it really then just potentially bad marketing that we're now being uh, brought, brought to light? Like, if it's really not going to have that much effect, is it the marketing people they're doing what they think is a good thing, but in essence, it's going to bite us in the butt on it because it's well, going to. I think I think that marketing guys tend to sit around tables and boardrooms. I've done the same myself, and somebody comes up with an idea, and suddenly it's it's a hot button. I think that I don't think there's there's a I don't think like I mean, home is a good example. I don't think there's a disingenuous element to that, and I don't think you're necessarily when you buy you know um, Isla barley or whatever it might be that you're necessarily buying into the terroir element to it i think you're buying into the it's homegrown the barley's local it's local mm -hmm. you know the water source locally i think and, and and it's you know this warehouse locally i think you're buying more into the fact that it's 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 farm to table rather than necessarily there's a flavor element to the whiskey you're drinking simply because the barley was grown in joe schmoe's field in octomore yeah. Yeah, right. but marketers but the market that, is yeah. but marketers take that and they run with it and this is where we've gotten into some bad habits with marketers where they've romanticized whiskey and they've sort of glossed over some of those bigger truths and we well I think, I think I think there's two schools of thought there there's the, the marketing guys who well every marketer just wants to increase their case sales and so if they feel that there is a market for, for the blurb that they're putting out, and then this is not something new. Uh, this is this is time immemorial. But the other side of the equation is that those who are not doing that will do everything they can to poo-poo it. Okay. 
Well, See? and I'm going to leave it with one more thought. We've all had 6163, Octomore 7173, we, we can tell a difference. There is a difference in flavor. So is it made that way or did it come out that way and it's distilled the exact same way? Maybe yeah. not because it's put in barrels and they're choosing the barrels as well, but. They are. It's the pot for million. That's the big. Thing. I, I look at it as long as the marketing, the marketing can do whatever they want. As long as the end, they're not lying to me. If, if it is, hey, look, I love the fact that it's the, the barley from this one happened to come from that field. And if you come here, you can drive down the street and talk to the farm. Or like it's, I love that. It's real. That, that part of the narrative is good. Uh, exactly. I, I, that, and, and I think that it, it's, it's one, I think, I think where I think the, a lot of people, the poo pooers in this, I probably include myself in that, is when it comes down to, to, to the, does it influence the flavor? Does yeah. it influence the, the narrative of provenance of the whiskey? Absolutely not. And that's a fantastic story. And the closer we can get to, to that, I think, you know, we, we can all buy Johnny Walker Black Label. But if you're buying something that is made on site by a, what is effectively a farm distillery, which farm distilleries didn't exist 20 years ago, I think that, uh, that that is a great story. I I would buy into that. But at the end of the day, it's 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 the buyer's market. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if people aren't buying it, they ain't going to be marketing it like that. They'll change their tune very quickly, and the labeling will change, and the, and the story will move on to the next bigger, better thing. But yeah. I think that right now, uh, there is that sense of it's not only just about the whiskey and the and the guide and the feel that you can meet. It's also the idea of somewhere an isla can do it like virtually no other part of Scotland because you've got this beautiful island on the west coast of Scotland. The, the, the people are great. The scenery is fantastic. It's a relaxed, beautiful atmosphere to be there. You're, you know, you every waves that you drive by, I'm sure you know every waves that you go past. When you leave the island with a bottle of whiskey that was made on the island by the, you're taking a piece of isla home with you, and, uh, and not just that distillery. And I think that. The island has got that when it does the Fishila uh, program with its festival, and uh, all of them collaborate on that front. It's selling Isla, not just it's selling it's selling a lifestyle, mm -hmm. and uh, but it's not selling a flavor profile. No, okay. uh, another, another quote. Thing. Here we go. Whiskey making is a byproduct of agriculture in Scotland is a land long under the plow. And the story of individuals and their names drawn from farming, sweat, and of the tale of whiskey is indicative of the close relationship that distilleries have with the communities they're centered all around. So it's a great quote. And I believe that sometimes we forget this link to the land and the farmer's influence. But my question to all of you is, do you think that we're coming back to recognizing farmers because of marketing or is it genuine? So let's link it to what we were just saying. Genuine or are we, is the marketing guy making me think that I really should do it, and that's why I'm doing it? I oh, think so, us. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Jim. I think I think us smaller guys always use that story that we're buying from Joe down the street because it's got a better story. And if we're going to ask you for more money, we better have a better story to ask, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. Like just so, as we, my was my tour, I did a bunch of uh, distillery tours. And pretty much every one of them was saying, yeah, we bought our wheat from Joe Blow across the street or down the highway or, and so-and-so, this was from here, from here, right? I'm the only distillery that we did was uh, a rum distillery and because they're doing sugar cane, of course, it's not growing down the street. It has sure. you know, <laughs> All the small distilleries are all using that farm to bottle story and because they are producing small amounts and this is their... They're really going after the, hey, we're supporting local. This is a small knit community. And, you know, we're making an awesome product because it's all local guys, right? See, I'd like yeah. to see all this, all this do done in a blind tasting. No story, <laughs> just product. Yeah. See, that, see what happens. Do we see behind it? Do we see that we are being manipulated and like it anyways? Because I'm paying more attention to it, but I know I'm being manipulated. But they're always being manipulated because they're doing stuff for me. It's like I don't know. <laughs> Again, I guess it's, it's it's your own personal lifestyle. It says it's a, set, it's a buyer's market. I mean, I wouldn't mm -hmm. even just go down the road of saying uh, that it, it that it's about you know buying from the local farm. This this happens on an urban level. I mean, I I came across this trying to sell an English gin in New York City, and. There are two uh, great distilleries in New York, and New York distilling companies making great gin. So if I'm if I'm trying to get my bottle into the back shelf, and it's all about 
you know, a city like New York, it's all about real estate. You know, th you have to be able to sell X amount of bottles for you to be able to even get on the back bar. Sure. Uh, if, if it came down to my imported gin versus something that was made in Brooklyn, I'm going to lose every single time to the Brooklyn made gin because New Yorkers like to think they're buying New York. That I mean, and I think that was a very hard thing for me to try mm -hmm. and explain to the owners back in London that I think, I think, I don't know if it's particularly New York is very strong at this, is that they don't like to be sold anything. They like to, they like to buy. It's their decision. And even for a city of 20 million, it really is uh, all about local, you know, it, particularly places like in Brooklyn, Williamsburg, this kind of, is areas where it, 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 you, know, you can't live in Williamsburg unless your beard is six inches long and this kind of stuff. So they, you, uh, so buying, buying New York is patriotic. <laughs> Nice. So that's why you, when you're traveling through New York, you hear the song New York, New York, like 50 times every, you know, in the block, and it just is on repeat. Yeah, but, yeah. They, they have it. I think they probably have it some somehow subtly messaged on the subway. You don't hear it, but somewhere in the background, Sinatra's giving it. Yeehaw. Yeah. It's the picture of it. It's the heart. It, it, you can see it everywhere. All right, David, I need to get into chapter four before we, we get out because we're, <laughs> we're, we're so far behind. It didn't, it didn't take me this long to write it. No, but you know what? When, when the conversation's great and the whiskey's okay. flowing, we, we indulge ourselves and we should. But chapter four, uh, initially we think it might be less important. It's 11 pages, but far from it. it. In my mind, it's got three elements that I find really, really important. So the religious, Celtic, Catholic etymology, the influence of the land, the farmer, like we were just talking about. And I don't know why. There was only probably a couple sentences about the farmer, but I clung on to this. And the barons themselves. So, uh, David, I don't think that I could do the etymology of whiskey-related names in Scotland justice in one or two quotes, even though I thought about doing it. Can you link, let's say, St. Columbia and the early church to whiskey for our viewers and our panel and me again? So just trying to link that because well, it, it's broad. I mean, obviously, the the the... The, the, the basis of the book, the philosophy behind it is, you know, what what do the facilities mean? Where where what, what is the etymology? Where does where do the names come from? Um, we discussed obviously the language origins, but also, you know, language is a language. There's a, there has to be a, a reason why something is called something, and most of it is agrarian. Most of it is agriculturally based, or it is. Um, descriptive of the landscape. I, I, the one I always tend to quote is Ben Romick, which means shaggy mountain. Uh, in, a, in an agricultural world, probably every square inch of potential arable land was under the plough and, you know, subsistence farming. So, yeah. so Ben Romick is probably the only place that had trees on it. So it, it looked like the shaggy mountain. That, that, that would, to me, allows us to see that area through the lens of someone who lived 500 years ago, for example. There are also, the, one of the things is that there are, there's very few, uh, well, there's only one single malt distillery that is named after an actual person, like deliberately named after a person, and that's Old Pulteney. So Old Pulteney is named after George Pulteney, who was the Member of Parliament for Wick in the north, very far northeast of Scotland, because he invested all the money to rebuild the harbours, for a lot of work and employment into the town. So when the distillery was built, they named it after the man. But unlike, say, you go to you know, Tennessee and Kentucky, every, you know, it's all Pappy Van Winkle and Jack Daniels and Elijah Craig and Yates Blanton, and so they're all named after people because it was those people in that time frame who were the founders of those distilleries. The distilleries in Scotland are so old that we're, we're, we're picking from dates that have come from an agricultural world. And those names of farms and such take us even further back. So to find that back to the likes of St. Columba and the Celtic saints was that the, the early Christian church in Scotland, as was across Ireland and particularly Wales too, it's likes of St. Patrick and St. David, was hugely influential it politically in the 6th through to the ninth century. Then after that, once you get about 1000 AD, the, 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 the Roman Catholic Church really becomes more dominant and it's really the end of the Celtic Church. Now, what the Celtic Church did was it had to evangelize and it had to bring people on board who were pagans, people who worshipped a pantheon of Celtic gods. So instead of going, what you're, what you're worshipping is rubbish, you're all going to go on the fire, here's the new church. They basically adopted what was already going on and just turned it. You know, we all know the story of Halloween, 
Christmas and the dates and the choosing of that. Easter is the Anglo-Saxon goddess of fertility, hence all the bunnies and the eggs and such. Um, but it wasn't just those festivals. A lot of the calendar was done like this. Uh, a lot of the Celtic um, missionary priests, because they were, and they were warrior priests, who were usually aristocracy or royalty. They carried the sword and the cross with them across the hills. You had to. They would worship in grottos and caves and such, where the old Celtic gods were. And they simply replaced one with the other. And instead of having this pantheon of gods, you tended to have this sort of legion of never-ending Celtic saints. So not just St. Columba, who's the famous one, but you have St. Ninian, St. Philan, uh, St. Marna, and so on and so forth. You have this great queen of Celtic saints. And they didn't all meander around the countryside, but they built up cults. So there's a lot of cults dedicated to a given saint. And St. Philan, I think, is the best example I give in the book, because St. Philan gives his name to Macallan. So Macallan means the plains of St. Philan. It's Macallan in Gaelic. So it's not son of, Mac is son of, that's not how it's spelled in Gaelic. It's M-E-G-H, Mach, which is a plain, a, a field of, a, like a meadowland and mm. of St. Philan, but with an H after the the F, uh, it becomes silent. So it's Machalan rather than Macphillan, Machalan. And so mm. the plains of St. Philan. Now, there was no St. Philan wandering about Lower Seaside 900 years ago, but there was definitely a cult to that saint who was there. And this we find in a lot of places. Isla, particularly places like Cahome and Caldalton, uh, you know, uh, they're, that, that island is very strong with that, as you find it. So the, 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 the use of the church languages in up again, Speyside has that as well. Um, Balveni is named after a bishop. It's, um, it's Balveni, it's ben, ben, I can't get wrong, wrong my, my tongue around it, Vendax Farm. And Balveni is the etymology that comes out of it. So the uh, um, Mortlach was the name of the bishopric. Um, uh, Longmorn is the glebe. The glebe is the land belonging to a church, and it means the literally the long rigs of the, the, the church lands. So there's a lot of underlying Christian naming going on that takes us all the way back to the first evangel evangelizing priest led by St. Columba in the late 6th century. But for the most part, it always it comes back to the yeah. land, right? Yeah, it all really dies back to the land because that's where whiskey comes from. Hmm. I, because you have to remember, the thing is that this is, I think that to me, which was a, one of the things I've been finding in current research that I'm doing, is that, of course, if you're making a legal whiskey and you want to sell it to uh, a, a store in Glasgow or a, a bar in Edinburgh or whatever, you, you don't have a name for it. So you don't want people to know... <laughs> That it's you know Jock McGregor's whiskey from Duda up the road. You you yeah. um you because the next knock you hear is the excise man. So you didn't name the whiskey after yourself, but it would have been known in the bar. Oh, can I get the whiskey from Blah Blah Farm, right. or can I get it from such and such a area? Because certain whiskeys were obviously better than others. Glenfiddich, Glenlivet is a great example of that. Glenlivet was famous for this. So. Whiskies were maybe not named, and people wouldn't come in specifically. There would there'd be no advertising for names. But if you knew, you would yeah. come in and say, "Can I have a you know a Glenfiddich, or whatever?" And you'd be given it. So I think the naming was about disguising it a little bit in that farming in background, rather than coming out with a you know Jack Daniel's Jim Beam and that kind of thing, because that would have been counterproductive. I love that as well. That's good. Yeah, yeah. A little bit of sneakiness involved with it. It's good. It's like um, it's you know what? It's uh, it's an hour and 23 minutes. <laughs> and uh, there are three questions that we didn't ask, but that's okay. We'll get to at least one of them next week when we start. <laughs> eventually, you'll get Eventually, you'll get to LaGuardia. We'll get to you know what? It's two times in a row that I, I haven't asked about LaGuardia, but it's Prohibition, so we can always come back to Prohibition. We're good. Uh, so that's it. That's all the time we have, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and we went over by 20 minutes, but we did well. I'm glad. I'm, I'm happy with how this went. It's been a fantastic evening. So thanks to our listeners. Thanks to our panel. Thanks, David. Uh, thanks, Dave, Drew, Sheila, Kent, Cheryl in the background, way back with her grandchildren. Hello, Nicole. And thank you, David, for another fantastic night. Absolute pleasure spending this time with everybody. And I hope everyone had as much of a fun time as I did. And it's going to continue for us afterwards as we sign off. But we'll raise a glass. Here's this. Uh, here we go. Here's the good company. 
Here's the good whiskey. Put that down. Here's the good <laughs> conversation. Here's to seeing you all next week, Saturday, November 21st, for our Whiskey Book Club's fifth book, but the third edition of this one right here, The Language of Lit Whiskey with author David McNichol. As a final note, as I say every week, if you want, don't want to miss a minute, future episodes, click like, click subscribe, click thank you, think, well, I don't know. I love ball. Click whatever you want. Just come back next week. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> thank you very much and have a fantastic night. Cheers, Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys.